It's supposed to start at 11.30, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so how many of you were just in Jason's talk previously? Okay, so some of you, not all of you. Um, so I'm Drew Fustini. I'm uh, part of the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. I'm one of the board members. We have uh, two other here at the Middle Linux Conference. We have Jason Kreidner, who's the co-founder of BeagleBoard.org, uh, and we also have Robert Nelson here, uh, who does our uh, Debian images and handles the kernel builds and all that wonderful stuff. So they're both around as well. Uh, and we also have the technical showcase this evening. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you uh, about uh, Google Summer of Code and some of the past projects that we have done uh, as part of uh, BeagleBoard.org. So how many people have heard of Google Summer of Code before? Okay, so most of you. Uh, so uh, yeah, basically it's a prog global program for students to get stipends for writing open source projects. So pretty, pretty cool thing. Um, it's been around for 12 years. Over 100 countries have participated. Over 500 open source projects. Over 12,000 students and over 30 million lines of code have been written. In this past year, in 2016, uh, there was 178 open source projects, such as our, uh, ours, uh, BeagleBoard.org. There were over 1,200 uh, university students, 67 countries. Uh, over 1,000 students completed it successfully, so around 85%. Uh, and each student that completed successfully got $5,500. So the timeline lists here, um, a few weeks ago, organizations applied in next this next week, coming week, we'll find out uh, what organizations were accepted. Uh, and then between that period and March 20th is when students should hopefully be talking with the mentoring organizations that have been accepted, um, figuring out what projects they might want to work on, what the needs of uh, the mentoring organizations like um, we've been in the past uh, might, uh, might be looking for. Uh, and then March 20th, this is probably the most important date right now, is students can start applying on March 20th. Uh, and then the beginning of May, uh, the students' proposals that have been accepted by the mentoring organizations are announced. And then the students actually start coding uh, at the end of May. And then there's a few uh, uh, points along the way during the summer. There's midterm evaluation in June, uh, final evaluation in project submissions in August. And then finally in October, uh, for the mentors from the different uh, mentoring organizations, they'll come to uh, Google's headquarters in uh, California and have a mentor summit. So there's a few requirements for students uh, that are going to participate in Google Summer Code. Uh, one is they have to be 18 years of age and older. Uh, they must be a full or a part-time uh, university student or be accepted for the fall term of, of this year. Uh, and it has to be an accredited university. So I've seen some questions on the mailing list of, from students that are from maybe an online university or something like that. So if it's not accredited, um, then unfortunately they can't participate. A uh, few other things like they have to be re eligible to work in the country that they're in. Um, and they can't have done it more than once. So they can't have been accepted uh, uh, to a previous uh, Google Summer of Code project. And that's different because in the past, students were able to do it more than, more than one year. But now it's just uh, you can only do it once. Uh, though the cool thing, a lot, of, a lot of students will then become mentors in following years. So the way the stipends get paid out is it's incremental. So there's the first evaluation in July, second evaluation in August, and then the final evaluation in September. Uh, it's changed a little bit this year in 2017. So instead of just being a flat amount for every student, uh, the amount is actually based on the country they're in. So uh, on the Google Summer of Code website, uh, there's a, a chart of depending on the country and the actual amount. Uh, Oh, another thing I should mention, the, the slides are up on the conference website, also the eLinux wiki. So there's a lot of hyperlinks in these slides. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can grab the slides and click on the links. So BeagleBoard.org, how many people have heard of BeagleBoard.org before? OK, pretty much everyone. Uh, so BeagleBoard.org is a community around building open source hardware uh, for makers, educators, and professionals. Um, so BeagleBoard originally came out back in 2008, uh, and it was one of the first affordable ARM development boards. Um, Jason was the co-creator co of that platform. And then uh, in 2011, uh, the BeagleBone came out, which was a smaller version of the Beagle board and more focused on uh, doing DIY projects that had um, more reasonable uh, headers for doing uh, um, interfacing with external, cir external circuitry. 
And then the most common beagle bone you'll probably find in projects um, out there uh, is the beagle bone black, and that came out in 2013. So because the beagle bone is open source hardware, there is a uh, wide array of different uh, variations of the beagle bone uh, from different manufacturers like Aero, Element 14, Seed Studio, and our most recent one is the BeagleBone Black Wireless. So if you notice that big uh, chip there in the middle, that's a, a, that's a system and package from Octavo, which is a new company in Texas. Uh, this came out last year, and it integrates a lot of the silicon that was in the BeagleBone Black into one package. So the advantage of that is now we have room to have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, also reduce the complexity of the board. Um, it's designed in Eagle now, which is a much more accessible CAD package than uh, the previous one. And tonight, at the technical showcase, we're going to have the um, BeagleBoard X15, and we'll also have a preview of the BeagleBone Blue. So come, come check that out this evening. So BeagleBoard.org Foundation, we're a U.S. nonprofit. Uh, we provide education around the design and use of open source software and open source hardware. We foster communication between individuals interested in open source. Uh, so probably one of my favorite Google Summer Code projects was the Beagle Logic by Kamar Abishik back in uh, 2014. So this turns the Beagle Bone into a logic analyzer, and a pretty good logic analyzer, 14 channel, 100 mega sample, has uh, 320 megabytes of uh, buffer space, so you can get 3.3 seconds of eight channel data. Um, also integrates with SIGROC, so you have the capability to decode all sorts of different protocols. Uh, so to get started, one of, the, one of the things that's nice about this is if there's an SD card image, so you just put the SD card in your BeagleBone, turn it on, and you can pull it up in your web browser. This is an example of how you'd hook it up. So there's a cape there, a BeagleLogic cape. Now you don't need the cape, it's just if you have five volt signals, the BeagleBone's 3.3 volts, so if you wanna hook it up to a five volt system like maybe an Arduino, you would need the cape, but the cape's not required to use the BeagleLogic software. Um, and that's another interesting point about Google Summer of Code is it's really about code. So you can have hardware be a part of your Google Summer of Code project, but it can't be the main output. The main output has to be um, a software. So this is the web interface uh, for the Beagle Logic. Uh, you can choose the sample rate, uh, select what channels you want to use, and then you can see the waveforms there. So this is a nice uh, interface for people that are maybe new to logic analyzers, but it also integrates into SIGROC, which is a great open source uh, project that uh, will decode uh, all sorts of different protocols. So here it's decoding audio data. Um, so it's nice that there's an option there for beginners and also for more advanced users that want to decode all sorts of different protocols. So one of the things that makes this possible is the fact that the BeagleBone has these programmable real-time units, or PRUs. So how many people have heard of the PRU before on the BeagleBone? Okay, so, so about half of you. Uh, so these are microcontrollers that are on the same die as the main ARM processor. So there are two 200 megahertz, 32-bit microcontrollers that have access to the same peripherals in the main DDR system memory as the ARM processor. So it allows us to do really um, high-speed, real-time tasks, and that's what the Beagle logic um, leverages to be able to handle this 100 mega sample, 14 channel logic analyzer use case. So Beagle logic is composed mostly of, there's PRU firmware, there's a Linux kernel driver that presents it as a um, character device slash dev slash Beagle logic. Uh, and then there is a Node.js server that provides that uh, web interface that I showed earlier. So Kumar kept on working on this, which was great. So in 2015, he submitted it to the Hackaday Prize and was chosen as one of the best product finalists. Uh, and he was also a mentor at that point, so he traveled out to the Mentor Summit in 2015 and also went to the Hackaday Super Conference. So, uh, he has a great blog post on his website that talks about that journey, um, and I recommend checking it out. If you grab the slides, you can click on that link. Uh, so he kept on working on BeagleLogic and uh, was wondering what people wanted, uh, additional features they wanted, and a lot of people wanted analog, it turned out, analog sampling. Uh, he also, in 2016, last summer, was an was a intern at Google in Mountain View, so it was kind of cool to see the progression there from being a Google, Google Summer of Code student to being a mentor to then at, being an intern at uh, Google's offices. So it turned out that there was also a group at Google in 
in Google Research that wanted to have a high-speed data acquisition um, device. So they had created something called the PRU DAC, which is a cape for doing high-speed data acquisition. Uh, and it turned out they realized that they could leverage um, BeagleLogic. So they were able to use um, Kumar's uh, BeagleLogic um, software, and it turned out that it performed actually much better than the sample code that they had originally written. So another project I think that had a good impact was Beagle Ross. This was back in 2013. How many people are familiar with Ross, which is the robot operating system? Okay, so this was basically an integration of Ross into the BeagleBone, um, and the implementation was as an OE layer, an open embedded layer. Uh, so the BeagleBone part of it is he created a few um, ROS packages, so the ability for ROS to be able to um, talk to different sensors that you might connect to the BeagleBone and also control motors. And then that same student, Victor, uh, followed up the next year in 2014 with BeaglePilot. So this is a Linux-based autopilot for uh, flying robots based on the BeagleBone. So part of that was he ported ArduPilot to be able to run in Linux on the BeagleBone um, and also did ROS integration. And one of the nice things was at the end of this, he wrote a paper with some other people describing uh, the possibility of uh, open source Linux autopilots for drones, uh, which I think in 2014 was still kind of a, a more of a newer thing. Uh, most people were using microcontrollers, I think, back then. Uh, and one of the interesting things is they showed that Linux can perfectly be used to meet the real-time requirements needed by an autopilot, requiring only about a quarter of the processor on the BeagleBone Black, so I think that was pretty interesting. There's lots of interesting graphs and um, metrics in the paper, so I recommend checking that out if you have interest in that. And he then went on, Victor went on to create a company uh, called Early Robotics to commercialize the Beagle Pilot. So they have a product called the Early Brain, which is an artificial brain for making ro robots and drones, and you can see there there's a there's a quadcopter with the early brain, um, which is essentially a cape that goes on top of the Beagle bone along with the Beagle Pilot software. And there's also a, a spider, spider robot as well. So it's cool to see the progression from Google Summer of Code project to then creating something that's valuable to the community to then actually turning it into a product. And then kind of going on farther, there was also the BeagleSat in uh, 2014, or sorry, 2015. Uh, so it's a nano satellite platform based on the BeagleBone. So essentially software that would allow, would help you in the process of developing a uh, Linux-based CubeSat. Uh, so one of the main things here was the ability to interface um, sensors like IMUs into um, the Python library that's popular on the BeagleBone, PYBBIO, uh, and then be able to fuse, um, do sensor fusion. So be able to combine um, digital compass and accelerometer, gyro, um, and, and be able to use that. So uh, I think that's still an ongoing project. So um, someone asked me yesterday if I knew of any uh, Linux systems that were in orbit. And uh, yes, you did. OK, awesome, cool. Uh, so another interesting project was the USB sniffer. So this was all the way back in 2010. Uh, and this was with the Beagle board, um, which had uh, several USB ports on it. Uh, so the way that this works is you connect a USB device and a USB host, and you're able to sit in between and sniff the USB traffic. So it can be pretty useful for doing development and also probably doing reverse engineering, trying to get Linux drivers working for various types of hardware. And one of the other... Uh, I think really useful projects was user space Arduino. So this was done back in 2013 by two students. Uh, and this was to provide a way to run Arduino code in Linux. So uh, are, have most people heard of Arduino here? Okay. Uh, so pretty simple way of programming a microcontroller with the simplified wiring language, which is based on C++. Um, so a lot of people coming into the um, Beagle community, BeagleBoard commu Beagleboard.org community, using BeagleBones, oftentimes are coming from more simple microcontroller boards like Arduinos, and they're pretty comfortable with that level of abstraction of writing uh, Arduino sketches. So uh, it's a really nice to have that ability for them to start using their code that they were using their Arduino in Linux. So uh, this was an implementation to be able to run Arduino sketches in Linux. And this project was done on the BeagleBone, but it actually, because it's just implementing in Linux, it's um, 
uh, applicable to other boards as well, and other projects have gone on to use this as well. Uh, so there's more information there if you want to check out examples in, in code and uh, screencast of how it all works. So this past year in 2016, we had seven projects, uh, one of which is the Beagle Scope, which was cool to see that build upon Beagle Logic. Uh, so a few of the students, I told them I was doing this presentation, and I was like, it would be great if you could give me some slides about your, um, your project. So Zubin was one of the people that uh, provided me with some slides. Um, so essentially what Beagle Scope is, is to be able to hook up a ADC with a parallel bus to the beagle bone uh, using the PRU. So the way that this is done is by leveraging the IAO subsystem. So basically, you're taking the PRU, you're using it as a, you're using it as a parallel bus to be able to um, connect to a high-speed uh, parallel ADC, and then exposing that uh, with the IO or the industrial IO, the industrial IO subsystem, the Linux kernel. So. Beagle Scope is composed of three things. There's an I.O. device driver. There's the parallel interface bus driver for that parallel bus that's connected to um, the Beagle Bone, and then a platform-specific driver as well. So the main thing, if you're interested in using this to consider, is if there is a device driver for what you want to use. So for example, is there a device driver for the ADC that you want to use? In this case, he was looking at a particular high-speed ADC board, um, which there was, uh, he was developed a device driver for that as well. Uh, so this is basically a way to expose the high-speed capabilities of the PRU um, as a device in the IO layer. And links there to uh, different information about the project. It supports reading raw data. and also supports uh, buffered capture using IAO buffers. More links about the project, um, wiki, uh, source code. One of the things that's cool about Google Summer of Code is the students keep a blog, and they're supposed to update it every week. Um, so it's cool to be able to go back and look and see the progress of the project along the way. One of the other projects from last year was um, multi-channel sound driver for the BeagleBoard X15. So the BeagleBoard X15 is uh, probably our most capable board, and that's a new board that's coming out. You can see that at the technical showcase tonight. But it has a dual-core A15. It has also DSP. So this project was to um, leverage that capability into a uh, high-performance sound system. So Henrik was another student that provided me with some slides about his project. Um, so previous to this project, there was a BeagleBone cape that they created called CTAG, which was a multi-channel I2S sound card that you could use with the BeagleBone. And this Google Summer of Code project was about being able to use that with the new X15 board and leverage the, the higher performance of the X15. So the first part was to port the audio card drivers to the processor that's in the BeagleBoard X15. Uh, it's using, I think, an analog devices, um, uh, really uh, good uh, ADC there or something like that. So they had to port over the driver for that. And then the other part was to create a user space library to be able to utilize um, the DSP that's in the X15. So it has dual core uh, DSPs in the X15, so they created a user space library to make it easier for creating audio applications to leverage that. And so it's called libdsp x15. It uses OpenCL to offload operations to the DSP. One of our other projects back in 2016 was the idea of exposing the PRU, which is that the two microcontrollers that are in the BeagleBone, to add additional peripherals that you might need. So this project implemented a uh, I2C controller and a SPI controller uh, in the PRU. So the BeagleBone has a lot of I.O. The Sitara chip, the TI Sitara chip that's in the BeagleBone has a lot of I.O., but you might need more. You might want more uh, I2C master or another SPI bus. So in this case, you could use this to then create additional peripherals using the PRU. And this project was to have the BeagleBone act as a spy slave. So usually with these Linux systems, they're usually acting as a spy master. But in this case, it is to use the BeagleBone as a spy slave in, in, as part of a greater system. Uh, and one of the mentors, actually, Michael, is in the back there. 
So if you have any questions about this, you might want to chat with him later. Um, but uh, it was pretty interesting uh, to see using the BeagleBone as something that uh, is a little bit different than what you normally do with a uh, Linux system. Uh, and finally, uh, I think the last uh, project I'm going to talk about is um, another project from 2016, which was to add uh, support for the new hardware that's in the BeagleBone Blue. So the BeagleBone Blue is a BeagleBone with hardware to make it good for doing robotics projects. So we have motor drivers, uh, sensors, IMU, um, different things like that. So this project was to uh, get, get those drivers working uh, in the Linux kernel. So in Jason's previous talk, he was talking about how a lot of the existing demo code for the BeagleBone Blue is done in user space. So this project was to get that working with the uh, device drivers that exist in the kernel. Uh, so I think that is um, all the projects I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind, if any of you are students, undergraduate or graduate students, or you know graduate or undergraduate students, they can apply on March 30th. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great thing, and you get to work with mentors uh, from the industry, and you get paid, and you create open source code that you can use in your, your portfolio and resumes and job interviews. So I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, I think that was rather short. So if there are any questions, I, we, can, we can chat. Or Jason, you have anything you want to add? Yes. So um, we applied uh, as an organization. We won't find out until next week if BeagleBoard.org is going to be um, accepted. But uh, we are definitely looking for mentors. Um, in addition to students, we need mentors to help those students achieve uh, the project goals that they want. And of course, people don't have to mentor with BeagleBoard. They can mentor with any mentor organization for GSUC. Yes. Yeah. So there's, uh, I think last year, there was 178 projects. So there's all sorts of different projects. So Hopefully, whatever you're interested in, there's probably a project along those lines. I was just oh. Be a oh, you were? OK, cool. <laughs> um, so, f yeah. Well, it's on the video. Oh, OK. Um, how realistic is it for a student uh, to spin up on a PRU project for a GSOC program if they've never done it before? I think it probably depends a lot on their background. Okay. Um, you know, if, if they've done uh, low level, programming before. Like microcontrollers. Uh, the one thing that's nice now is we have several mentors that were previously students. So Kumar Abhishek and now mm -hmm. um, Zubin, who had done the BeagleScope, is now looking to be a mentor. So, so they'd be available for yeah, other ones. Yes, great. Yeah. So okay, that's good. the great thing. And I think since BeagleBoard.org has been in Google Summer of Code for many years now, it's great to see that kind of uh, succession of from a student to a mentor, and then they're able to um, help out. And for us, what we try and do is we try and get um, prospective students to join our IRC channel uh, or join the mailing list and talk about their ideas, and then hopefully kind of have a nice organic process where it's like, hey, yeah, I could probably be a mentor for that, and the student's like, I'd be interested in this. So for the PRU, I think we actually have a fair, fairly good amount of of people involved that, that have done projects with the PRU, uh, especially the people that did the Beagle Logic and the Beagle Scope. So, and for us, in terms of uh, the, I think the differentiating factor of uh, the Beagle Bone and the Beagle Board is the PRUs are a big part of that. So, in general, we're we're very, very keen to have PRU projects. Did you? Yeah. I just wanted to try to address some of the technicalities of the, 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 the complexity of the PRU projects. Um, we, we made a transition um, in, for, for BeagleBoard, how we try to support the PRUs from UIO into remote proc. And that was really um, on the, the push of what we thought the, the future of Linux was. It's about trying to do things in the kernel. So UIO is a way to simply memory map the entire peripheral. Um, and there is a, a user space library that uses, utilizes UIO to do all of the peer you management. Um, but, but we were trying to, we, we did get away from that. So that's still, um, that, that, that UIO stuff is mainline. You can use the UIO library to load and run PRU code. And there's an API for doing that. 
Um, but, but I think for a while it got a little bit harder because we transitioned away from that. Um, and so that did make for some of the documentation online to be a little bit confusing. Um, it's really simple to, um, you create an ELF binary now for the PRUs um, and remote proc will load it, right? So you just put it into lib firmware and you, there's a, a couple of sysfs entries where you just poke um, and it will load it. Of course, at boot time, you just, you, it'll just like you the, specified in the device tree and it'll just load it at boot time like it does all the other firmwares. Um, but um, you know, if you want to change it, you can just prod some C sysfs entries and it'll reload and run that firmware. Now communications at that point, um, you know, a lot of, there's a RP message, which is a pretty formal way of doing communication between the processors, and that still gets to be a little bit confusing because you have to have code on the peer use to understand how to do peer uh, to do RP message. Um, I think a lot of people didn't understand. It's still just as simple as mem mapping the peripheral and using the shared memory space for communicating. There's nothing stopping you from doing that just because you use remote proc for the loader. So there's almost no API needed to work with the peer use, right? Remote proc is not mainline at this point. Um, it's, um, uh, I don't know, there's, a, there's an, I think TI was doing another patch submission um, imminently. Um, you know, we, we do maintain it against the 4.9. Um, so for, for BeagleBoard, there's one against the LTS kernel, the 4.9 LTS kernel um, for students doing development. But, the, you know, I, I, you know, it's any of those any day now things I, 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 that remote proc will go mainline. Um, but UIO is, UIO is mainline, but you know, again, we, we think that the ultimately mainline will go away from that, and so we're trying to get on the future. Cool. Sorry for the inside baseball. Was there something else, that, other points that you had about Google Summer of Code? It just meant that we were looking for, that we were looking for mentors? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, what do mentors do? What are the responsibilities of the mentors? Um, so the mentors are really there to help um, both before, uh, so before, during this time after the organizations are accepted and the students apply, that's really the time where hopefully potential mentors and potential students will discuss either on mailing lists or on IRC uh, what projects the student are, is interested in and also what projects would be good for the organization. Um, so that's one of the times where there's, there's a fair amount of activity. Uh, one of the things that helps a lot is if you have multiple mentors. So uh, if it's just one mentor, it can be a lot of work for one individual. So um, we try and get multiple mentors for a project, uh, especially with time zones involved. You know, it can be somewhat difficult depending on if the mentor and the, the student are in different time zones. So uh, it definitely helps a lot to have um, two or three mentors for a project. Um, to, to share that load. And I think then additional prospective mentors are less uh, likely to be discouraged because they know it's not going to just be solely, you know, on them. Uh, so do you have any uh, ideas? What's that? Yeah. Uh, as being one of the administrators um, for, for, for our effort, we, we do try to distinguish between what we call primary mentors and like secondary mentors and something because a primary mentor has the responsibility of defining the project and passing or failing the student. And we do expect a pretty strong commitment from, from that primary mentor. Um, but we do look for secondary mentors to try to handle when that primary mentor is not available. Um, somebody in the region maybe that speaks, um, can, can speak more clearly to somebody in a, in a particular region. Um, we do try to find people that overlap in time zones. Um, so we're looking for a lot of secondary mentors. Um, that, so you don't have to have that big pressure of like, I'm the guy that's gonna pass or fail this student and I'm the guy that's gonna define what's in and out of the project. Um, you can just show up and support it, right? It, there's, it's an open mailing list, it's an open IRC channel. We try to keep the communication um, between the students and the mentors through those channels. We've, we've experimented with Google Hangouts and even phone calls and other things, but it just doesn't scale to a community effort. We try to step them back to IRC. Um, that's the way that we try to support the students. It works really well um, when everybody's engaged. And, and so if you can spend some time on IRC and on the mailing list answering newbies questions and giving them some guidance, just, just do it. And you know, we do ask for, we do encourage you to kind of sign up, be accessible, know, let people know who you are. Um, but the, it doesn't necessarily require a huge time commitment. We're just not going to assign you a student if you're not going to put the time in. 
the, the time commitment um, for primary mentor, um, the, the, the expectation on our part is the students are putting in 30, 40 hours. Um, and so that the, the mentors would be available um, to answer a couple of questions um, every day, right? And so multiple times during the day. So they would be accessible on the IRC for if the students get stuck. They can idle there, they don't need, they can do their jobs um, and just answer questions, but they should probably allocate, um, you know, five hours a week um, to, to the student to, that's probably a good eyeball figure. Um, it's, it's not a, a zero effort. <laughs> One of the other things that is nice is, um, so in addition to the mentors, is you can also have people come in that have specific domain knowledge or skill in a certain area to help out. So one of the things I thought was really cool was we've, um, with uh, BeagleScope, I think it was, or is it BeagleScope? Okay. Uh, so it was using an IIO driver, so there's this industrial IO subsystem, the Linux kernel. Uh, so Michael was actually get, able to get the maintainer of that subsystem, Jonathan Cameron, to, to come onto our IRC channel sometimes and, and, and talk with the student involved with that. So that was really cool to be able to get like, the person that actually runs that subsystem to come in and, and give some guidance. Um, so uh, I think there's kind of a, a range there, yeah. But for, for being a primary mentor, it's, it's uh, definitely a, a significant commitment, I think, you know. And that's one of the things I guess I should have mentioned at the beginning about the students is Google Summer of Code is considered basically a full-time job for the student. So like 40 hours a week, like every day working on it in the weekly reports are a big part of that, you know. So um, it, re it really is like a full-time engagement for the student uh, during the summer. Do you have anything to add, Michael? Okay. If, if you do become a primary mentor, um, make sure you have a good um, secondary group because there, you know, there's going to be times when you, you can't be there for the student. And um, I picked up a lot of slack this last summer, and I, I think it helped a lot for the other guys. It, it really lessened their burden because these these are like, professionals. They have timelines and all this other stuff going on and these students can get pretty demanding. So um, if, you, if you have the time, it's rewarding, but it can be demanding if you're a mentor in the primary domain at least. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions or comments about Google Summer of Code? Oh, OK. Uh, I guess if that's uh, all there is, then uh, we can, I think we ended with, uh, you'll have some time left before the next. Actually, it's lunch, right? So I guess you can go to lunch early. All right, well, thank you. Uh, if you know anyone, tell them to apply.